I, I looked this up late um, and didn't get it into the notes. But let me give you a passage, a scripture, as we begin our uh, presentation today on the subject, Heaven is Not a Mystery. <clears throat> I'd like to thank the, the teachers that have uh, encouraged and helped me with this lesson, those that I have looked at, those whose words I remember. Uh, Dr. Wilbur M. Smith, who was former dean of the, uh, at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, ended up at uh, Fuller Theological Seminary and spent a number of years there. He's passed on, been gone, but I still remember the things that he taught and said. Uh, David Jeremiah, whose uh, teachings on heaven are extraordinary. For uh, Frank Boyd from the Assemblies of God, who has uh, put together a number of lessons on doctrines of the Bible. Of, of uh, um, I can't think of his name. His first, first name is Ma- his last name is Meyer, uh, or first name Meyer Perlman. Uh, Meyer Perlman was his name that put together a. a a uh, document that was used uh, by the teachings for the Assemblies of God Berean class that we took in correspondence. He put together the doctrines of the scriptures and among those uh, teachings were the teachings on on heaven. Things that I have learned, lessons that I have received, things I remember said that I don't remember who said them. All of that culminated together at this antique age of which I am. I remember stuff, but I don't remember who. Yeah, so I have these thoughts for you this morning. I trust it will be a blessing. The passage of Scripture that I would have had I thought about it earlier put at the beginning of this lesson is taken from Second Peter chapter 3 beginning with verse 9. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 9 through 14. <clears throat> the Lord is not slack. I'm reading from the New King James. Concerning his promises. That's an interesting uh, word to use. Slack. He doesn't lollygag. That would be a good southern term. God don't lollygag with his promises. You you buy that? (laughs) Okay. As some count slackness or lollygagging. (laughs) But he is long-suffering. He is extraordinarily patient, putting up with a lot of stuff. And I can look back over my years and say, Amen. Oh, my word, has he put up with a lot of stuff from Johnny. Because he's not willing that any should perish. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that, Christy. But that all should come to repentance. All those meatheads you're praying for. Unsaved loved ones. God's got a reason why the rapture hadn't happened yet. It's them. Go over there and kick them in the shins and say, get saved so we can all go up. I'm tired of waiting. Thank you. <clears throat> but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. And the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. I hope that gives you a whole new appreciation for what he is calling the day of the Lord. Because there's a whole bunch of teaching that considers the day of the Lord the rapture, the day of the Lord the tribulation, the day of the Lord the second coming, the day of the Lord the millennial reign, and the day of the Lord which he's referring to as the end of the earth which we find at the end of Revelation that says heaven and earth will pass away. That's what he's calling the day of the Lord. And he's quoting from Isaiah when he's talking about it. Because Isaiah says the same thing in the last three chapters. He talks about the world melting. And heaven melting and becoming nothing. It ain't no giant makeover, folks. It's a complete destruction and making a new one. Now, I can't understand why people just don't take the Bible for what it says. They've got to help God out with what He's saying by changing it. Oh, He's not going to destroy the earth. He's just going to make it over. (laughs) Oh, yeah. uh -uh. No, 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 no. And when we get to talking about the city of Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, in this lesson, 
I'm going to make a statement that's going to surprise you possibly. The new Jerusalem will not fit on this planet. It won't work. The physics of it that God has established and made discernible to even silly people like me that don't know as much as I would like to know about mathematics and physics and chemistry and calculus. I wish I knew more. I wish I understood more. This earth can't sustain a city as big as talked about that is the new Jerusalem. God has to make a new earth where it will work. A new one, not a made over one. <clears throat> and at the end, I'm going to get to it before I get there. <laughs> Scripture talks about the new earth and the new Jerusalem, but there isn't a single letter of a word that talks about the new heaven. Not, a, not, not nothing. Absolutely, completely void of description in Scripture. Why? Paul said, no man knows the day of the hour. No, Jesus said that. <laughs> Paul said, it has, no man has, no man, no eye has seen. Thank you, son. <laughs> I need your help. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has in store for them that love him. You ain't never going to know. <laughs> Until he makes it. That heaven is a mystery. But the heaven that God's sitting in now is not a mystery. We're going to talk about that one. Okay, and I got off track again. <laughs> Verse 11. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Hey, that car you drove today? Huh? It's going to turn to powder. And get blowed away just like talcum. That beautiful house that you've been working on ain't so, is so pretty and nice, and every little thing is just in its place and every place for a thing. Woohoo! It's going to turn to powder and get blowed away. When we get to heaven and look at our mansion, I'm going to ask Della, what was all that vacuuming for? <laughs> <laughs> She says, pride and ownership. <laughs> God gave it to me and I take care of it. <laughs> but if we realize this, that things are so temporary, we realize how temporary this life is. I, I was so gripped with a song yesterday when we were flipping through YouTube stuff and I ran across a Gaither video from way back, 90s, old friends, and they got to talking about Rusty Goodman, who passed away, and they were talking with his daughter and how much her dad meant to her. And just a tremendous singer, wonderful man, and they played the song that he was really famous for. Seems like lately I've got leaving. I've got leaving on my mind. I want to be where my loved ones are. But I want to take you with me. <laughs> so it's I'm torn. I'm, I, I understand what Paul's saying. I want to be there, but for your sake, I'm still here. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. There he goes again. How come he has to say that twice? because I plumb forgot already. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth. Ooh, I think I heard that somewhere once before. He gets it from Isaiah 2. In which righteousness dwells, won't you be pleased to know that truth and righteousness and justice and honor and dignity and kindness and, and goodness and courtesy rules and people are take responsibility for their actions isn't that isn't that something where you want to be therefore beloved verse 14 look forward looking forward to these things be diligent to be found by him 
in peace without spot and blameless. So we've got to we've got to work to do. Be at peace with yourself and with your family and with all men and live a righteous life. Don't don't try to get even. <laughs> don't worry about getting even with the guy that cut you off. <laughs> <clears throat> you drive down the road and there's stupid people, just say, in the name of Jesus, be stupid someplace other than around me. Go ahead and be stupid, but don't do it over here. <clears throat> just let them go. Okay, I'll get back to my notes now. Top of page one. Scottish preacher Thomas Guthrie once wrote, If you find yourself loving any pleasure more than your prayers, any book better than the Bible, any house better than the house of the Lord, any table better than the Lord's table, any person better than Christ, or any indulgence better than the hope of heaven, be alarmed. Intentionally or unintentionally, there are far too many Christians who have find themselves loving the prospects of heaven less than they do the indulgences of this world. In words of Guthrie, we should be alarmed at that reality. <clears throat> Hebrews says, There are many weights and sins that drag us down. And Jesus said in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot, the people were preoccupied with the cares of life, were just too busy to be looking for Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Out of sight, out of mind is a proven truism. Heaven is definitely out of our human sight. The only way to see heaven is to read and rehearse the truth about heaven that is found in Scripture. But even after we do that, there are many things about heaven that we just do not understand. We wonder sometimes, is heaven really real? Is it actually a physical place like earth? Why does scripture say there are three heavens? If heaven is real, does that mean hell is also real? Is there a place called purgatory? Where do those who pass away go? What are we going to do in heaven? Is heaven boring? Do people wear white robes and play harps? Do they stroll down streets of gold? What about the angels? One man prayed, God, is there going to be golf in heaven? And an angel showed up and said, I got good news for you and bad news. Yes, there's golf in heaven. The bad news is your tee off time is tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. <laughs> what are the physical changes that I am going to have to experience in order to go to heaven? I don't even really, really like to get new shirts. I got a new shirt this week. See my new shirt? Isn't it great? Me and me and uh, me and, <laughs> me and Brianna read the memo. Red top, blue bottoms. So did so did Patricia. Way to go, Patricia. Yeah, red top and blue bottom. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Three is a witness from heaven. Yeah, by golly. <laughs> I, I, I like my jeans. I like I wear jeans. I, I remember when I was fixing to retire, this lady that I worked for at, at the time, she says, what are you going to wear when you, when you retire? I said, blue jeans all day long, blue jeans. She says, how much? And I says, till they're dirty or they stand up by themselves in the corner. You know? <laughs> you know? And uh, she laughed. And she, she said, my husband's retired. He wears shorts black shoes and black socks. <laughs> I said, well, I'm not into shorts, but that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, no, he's not wearing sandals. Yeah. <laughs> what are the physical changes I'm going to go through in order to go to heaven? Because this body ain't going to make it. Will I be able to recognize my friends and family? When you get to heaven, I believe you will be so relieved and overjoyed that you are there, you won't think of a lot of Christian uh, questions that you have down here. I can't wait to get to heaven to find out who truly shot JFK, but when I get there, I probably won't remember to ask. That's what I, kind of, I'm kind of, I was thinking about, having a little piece of paper I could take with me when I go. <laughs> By the way, I had this list... 
Where'd it go? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why is heaven important? Sunday school teacher talked to her fifth grade class about heaven. She said, being good doesn't get you there. Giving away money will not get you there. So how do we get to heaven? One little boy spoke up real quickly. must have been Joey. And said, you got to die first. <laughs> That's how you get to heaven. You have to die first. If the rapture don't happen, that's how we're going to get there. We sing the song about going to heaven, but in order to get there, you got to, that's not the prospect we were thinking about, you know. In a George Harris poll, they found out that 82% of Americans believe that there's a heaven. 63% said they're going there. That's very interesting when you think that most of those people that they were talking to were sinners. Every time we drive down the road, you can't help but see crosses on the side of the road where there's been a fatal accident. And I read in the paper what the family members say about that person that died. God needed another angel. Boy, if that's all your hope you got, it's pretty slim. God has a wonderful destination prepared for all those who believe in Him. Unfortunately, many Christians who get their eyes off the eternal invest their time and trying to create a heaven on earth. I think the lack of sermons about our current temporary life here is to blame. Not too long ago, I gave a message about Matthew 24 where Jesus talked about the days of Noah and the days of Lot. I pointed out that in the last days, the world will be overly obsessed with materialism. Even worse are Christians who quote scriptures claiming their biblical right to having more possessions in this world, or if I may kindly say, more stuff. It is. You ever drive down the road and see all the people who got these fancy schmancy cars that are sitting in the driveway? It's because they got so much junk in their garage they can't even put their car in the garage anymore. And you add up all the junk that's in the garage, it don't amount to the price of a car, huh? I, if you want a really decent truck today, you know what you're going to be spending for a real, a full size truck, huh? Sixty grand. For a nice full size truck with bells and whistles on it. Dude, are you crazy? I read this last week about some guy that it, it his it's about seven years. Seven years ago he bought a Tesla, hundred and forty five thousand dollars for that Tesla, huh? Okay. Well, he got out of his Tesla and the battery died and he can't get back in it. It's locked the car. And the dealer says the only way to fix it is that they have to get in there, they have to mess with it and put a new battery in his Tesla. $26,000 for a new battery for his electric car. And how many can say my mama didn't raise no fools? In my family, that was my brother, not me. I don't know. <laughs> Jesus said in Matthew 8 20 foxes have holes birds have nests but I don't have a place to lay my head and Christians are talking about more stuff again he says in Matthew 6 33 seek first the kingdom of God then all the things you need for life here will be added to you read it that's what he was saying C.S. Lewis said, if you aim at heaven, you will get earth thrown in. If you aim at earth, you will get neither. How are you doing so far, folks? This, won't, this message will not fly in 90% of the churches in the United States. They want to be told they're okay in their pursuit of stuff is what they ought to be doing. What are the three heavens? Isaiah 55, 9 through 10 tells us that there is an atmospheric heaven. This is the heaven where clouds are formed and rain falls and birds fly right out the window right there. Okay, that's the that's first heaven. Genesis chapter 1, 14 through 17 describes a celestial heaven. Sun, moon, stars, planets, galaxies. We call that outer space. Then there is the third heaven, which is an invisible heaven. 
It's the residence of our God and the holy angels. Paul talks about the third heaven in 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 4. He says that there was a man that he knew that went there and saw things that he was not allowed to talk about. God and his throne in heaven are mentioned in Psalm 11, 4, Matthew 5, 16, and 6, 9. This is the third heaven. That heaven is our destiny when life here is done. Jesus said in chapter 14 of John, verses 1 through 4, that he has gone there to prepare a place for all who have made him Lord. He said he is preparing a special place for each one of us in his father's house, in his father's domain, his, his kingdom. Then he said he would return to take us there. Happy day, happy day. If we can trust his word for healing or meet our daily needs, we can trust his word that he's going to take us to live in his father's house forever. We're going to be translated and taken out of here. If you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, believing that the rapture is going to be taking place and we're going to go up with him, that's a piece of cake. You can get past the resurrection of the dead. You got the rest of it made. That's, a, that's the tough one. Where is this place called heaven? Well, first, it's not here on earth. Uh, earth is a mess. I wouldn't want to live here forever. We understand that heaven is up from the earth, but up from Australia is different than up from Los Angeles. If we have a, if we have a clue about where up is in the book of Isaiah chapter 14, it's describing Satan. Isn't that a funny place to find something out about heaven? He wanted to promote himself to be equal with God. He wanted to go to the north. Isn't that interesting? By the by, again, I'm going to take a detour real, real quick. I have all my life heard the statement that Satan's downfall was pride. You know that there was something else? And I want to thank Derek Prince for pointing it out. It was self-promotion. In, in, in secular circles, when I worked in the government, we referred to it as kingdom building. I wanted my department to be the biggest department with the most money going on around here. Kingdom building, that's satanic. That's self-promoting yourself to a position that you really probably aren't qualified to hold. There's a, a book called The Peter Principle. It talks about people who are able to do a job real well. They get a promotion and they fall flat on their face. They were better doing what they were doing than move up into another level where they don't do so good. <clears throat> Astronomers have discovered that the universe spins around the North Star called Polaris. Are you familiar with that? Do you understand that our Earth spins around our North Pole, right? Okay, the equator is spinning like this. But if you stand in the middle of the North Pole, you can just stand there and look at everything that's going on underneath your feet and you don't turn. You're stationary. The Polaris star, the North Star, is stationary. Okay? Sailors use the Polaris to guide their ships in open sea. Is that the north where Satan wanted to go? Bible scholars say, yeah, it is. The third heaven is in the north of the celestial outer space. But even if you disagree with me, it doesn't change what Jesus said. He's preparing a place for you and me where His Father is. What makes heaven so special? Hebrews 9.24 says that Christ entered into heaven and appeared in the presence of God for us. Hebrews continues to say that Jesus to make intercession for us is in heaven doing it. What makes heaven so special? It's where Jesus is. I heard somebody say, wherever Jesus is, that's going to be heaven for me. I kind of agree. I, it, it's Him. It's Him more than the place. It's, it's Him more than the place. You follow what I'm saying? You know, I, I, I like my wife, but it isn't necessarily the house we live in. It's her where I want to be. You see? I like my house, but I don't want it over her. I want Jesus. I appreciate the mansion. I want Jesus. I appreciate the new body. I want Jesus. I want to be with Him.
Jesus is there. His Father, our Heavenly Father, is also there. Matthew 12.23 says, The general assembly of the church, the firstborn who are registered in heaven. Registered in heaven. Registered in heaven. And Ken, through a number of uh, stays at different hotels and gathering up all his points over a period of a long time, that it's like people getting free miles and you're flying all the time. Uh, staying in hotels, he got a free stay at a hotel. And so he was looking down the list and thought it would be nice for him and Christy to enjoy their anniversary of their wedding at a nice hotel. And so he looked at how many points he had and he looked to see where he could go that he was qualified for and he ran across a name of a hotel that made him fall out of his chair. He called him up. Are you serious? I can stay at the Hotel Del Coronado in San Diego for free? Yes. He registered immediately. <laughs> the moment you accept and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your name is registered in heaven. You're going. <laughs> and God says when you get there, He ain't letting you go. <laughs> You're staying. <laughs> He wants you there. Isn't that great? <clears throat> it sounds like checking into a hotel. You're registered. When a believer arrives in heaven, their name's already registered. What makes heaven so special? Our friends and loved ones are there. We're going to whip out Mexican train and we're going to have a party. <laughs> We're going to have fun. <laughs> oh, I love Mexican drink. Peter said in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4, our inheritance is reserved in heaven. When we became Christians, God became our heavenly Father. Through Jesus, we are heirs and joint heirs. Together with Him in heaven, everything my blessed Savior accomplished here on earth and the glory and the riches of heaven that he has attained for his his vicarious work of saving my soul when I get to heaven he's going to share it with me and you oh man I just wanted to be with him but now he's going to turn around and give me all the goodies that he earned from the incredible work that he performed in saving our souls by the shedding of his blood on the cross Is that overwhelming? No wonder we love Him. No wonder we praise Him. No wonder we thank Him. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 12, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Boy, He knew a whole much more about that than I do. Happy day, happy day. We will spend our entire time in heaven enjoying the rewards and the inheritance that we have received through our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Some think that this is more spiritual than material, but that turns literal interpretation of Scripture into metaphors or figures of speech. However, when the Bible refers to heaven, it uses descriptive language. It refers to thrones. It refers to altars. It refers to a temple. It refers to trumpets. It re refers to a sea of glass. It refers to jewels, to robes, to rivers, to buildings, to scenery, to pearls, to crowns. That ain't metaphors. That's the real deal. Far beyond man's comprehension to envision is available and prepared for you and me. Why? Because you trusted Him. Because you called on His name. And He saved you. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, Our citizenship is in heaven. We are like those who come to America to work or go to school and keep their citizenship in another country. Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 11, We have become strangers and pilgrims on earth. Because why? Our citizenship is no longer here. Our citizenship is in heaven. Jesus said in John 3, 3, Believers are born from above. 
Revelation 21, 27 says, Only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will be allowed to go to heaven. How do you get your name there? Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Claim Him as Savior and you will be saved. If you will believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and declare the name of Jesus as Lord and Savior, you're saved. That's Romans 10.10. Simple. Jesus told his disciples in Luke 10.20, Don't be happy because evil spirits obey you. Be happy that your names are written in heaven. The afterlife. Did you know that there's an organization called Afterlife Telegrams? I didn't capitalize that, but it is true. And for a fee, they will pass on a message that you want to be delivered to someone who has died. I'm serious. Huh? For a, for a fee. And how, you say? Well, they take your message to a terminally ill patient who promises to deliver your message when they reach the other side. And this is going on. They will. But there is a fine print in the contract that you sign that says delivery cannot be guaranteed. Somebody asks them, how come? They says, because we don't know where your loved one went. <laughs> I mean, the person that dies might go someplace else. <laughs> Whoopee! <laughs> Paul told the Thessalonians, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 And he uses the Jewish term for death, which is falling asleep. In John 11.11, 11, Jesus says that the same thing about Lazarus. The disciples were confused, so Jesus finally told him in verse 14, He's dead! <laughs> get, get a grip! In Acts 13.36, Paul basically said the same thing about King David. He has fallen asleep. It's just a Jewish term for those that have passed away. They're, and we'll talk about this. Why? It's because your body's in the grave, but your spirit goes someplace else. Where do those pass away go? Jesus told the story of two men who died, Luke 16, 19-31. One was rich, the other was poor, and his name is identified as Lazarus. Before we continue, let me say that the name Lazarus comes out of the Latin Catholic Bible. It doesn't come out of the Greek, and it shouldn't be in the English. There's a number of things that are out of the Latin Bible in the English Bible that should not ought to be there, because it's wrong. And the same thing is true about this name. It's not Lazarus, it's Eliezer. Eliezer means... God is my help. That's the man who was so dirt poor, he had to beg for food. God is my help. The dogs had to come and lick his sores in order to give him relief. God is my help. He had to lay on a mat without a cover. God is my help. How would you feel going around saying God is my help and be in a condition like that? Would it make you question whether God is your help or not? I mean, sometimes we can't get a parking place we don't like. <laughs> Into the civilized world as we know it. You ever act like that? Anybody else act like that? You walk, you, you drive around a parking lot for 15 minutes looking for something a little closer to the door? Some say this is a parable which means that it was a story to illustrate a truth or a doctrine. But Jesus uses a proper name here which he never did in any parable. Parable word, the word parable means to lay alongside. It's a simile. If I were to bring in some objects to demonstrate a lesson that I want to share with you today, it'd be a sermon illustration. That's what it's referred to. And parables are sermon illustrations. Not this time. This time it's a true story because Eliezer was a real man and the rich man was a real person who is unnamed. Dr. Wilburyn Smith said, in this story, Jesus takes our ear and puts it squarely against the door of hell. The Jews thought wealth was the sign of God's approval, but Jesus made the point that these two men went to two different places based on their relationship with God, not their status in life. Lazarus was carried by angels to paradise. The Jews called it Abraham's bosom. The rich man went into a place of torment. 
It says in Luke 16.23 that the rich man was in hell. The Greek word for hell is Hades, which actually means the grave. 1 Corinthians 15.55, it's the same word. Hades means the grave. Literally, Hades is a place of departed spirits, both good and bad. People, both good and bad, go to Hades. The Jews taught that Hades was divided into two different compartments, one of torment, the other in perfect delight. It was paradise. And Jesus confirms that this traditional teaching is absolutely true. The place to go when you die is either paradise or torment. Jesus says these two compartments were divided by a large gulf. In the Greek, it means an exceedingly great gulf. The rich man and Abraham had a conversation. That's amazing. They knew each other. They had feelings. They had memories. And they could talk to one another across this great gulf. One in torment, the other one in paradise. After Jesus died on the cross, he also went to paradise. Peter says he preached to departed spirits in prison. One Peter 3.19. Why? Because they were in prison because of the fall of man. Satan controlled where men went. And he held them there in this compartment. When Jesus rose from the dead, Matthew said that the graves were opened and many of God's people were raised back to life. Chapter 27. All those people that had died were now risen from the dead with Christ. And were walking around the streets of Jerusalem going up to their grandsons, Hey, Joey, hi! <laughs> Great stuff, huh? And then Joey running inside, Papa's outside! Oh, you're nuts. <laughs> no. It happened. Then, it says, literally, Jesus had emptied paradise of all of its captive believers. Then he took them all with him when he went up to heaven after he talked with Mary Magdalene who saw him in John chapter 20. He tells her, don't touch me. Paul tells us after Christ's resurrection, the saints are no longer go up to paradise and under the earth. They go to heaven. Just like Lazarus was escorted by the angels, Eliezer, was escorted by the angels to paradise, I believe that today's believers are escorted to heaven by angels. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord when, as 2 Corinthians 5, 8, when that one who was precious to you left this world, angels came and took them by the hand and escorted them into the presence of the living God there to be forever without pain or suffering or worry or dread, without persecution, without temptation, to be in eternal bliss with the living God who created them. That's where your loved one is. Purgatory, a spiritual waiting room. In Jesus' story about Lazarus and the rich man that were taken into two different places, Revelation 20, verses 11 through 20, says that death and hell will give up its dead to be judged by God. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 41, hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. Mankind goes to hell by choice for rejecting salvation from Christ. There is no alternative location found in Scripture. It's one or the other. Soon and very soon. Before Christ's resurrection, when a saint died, their body went to the ground, but their spirits went to paradise. When Jesus rose from the dead and ascended to heaven, He took all the saints in paradise with him. After his resurrection, when a saint dies, their bodies go to the ground, but their spirits will go to heaven. At the rapture of the church, the bodies of, catch this folks, all Old Testament and New Testament saints will rise from the dead. Those bodies will be changed into eternal, immortal beings and their spirits will be reunited with their transformed bodies. At the rapture, the bodies of the living saints will also be changed into immortal bodies. They will rise above the clouds to meet Jesus and the other saints. Then they all will go to heaven there to live forever. And here's my scriptures. 
John 14, 1 Corinthians 15, 2 Corinthians 3, 1 Thessalonians 4, and 2 Thessalonians 2. Confirms and verifies every single thing I've said to you. Our new bodies will be, one, immortal and incorruptible, 1 Corinthians 15. Eternal beings, no deteriorations, sickness or death. We will have immortal, incorruptible bodies. We will be identifiable, 1 Corinthians 15, 43. And 1 John says, we will be known as we are known. Number three, we will be like Jesus. Philippians chapter 3, verse 21 says, fashioned like unto his glorious body, no ghostly spirits, but just like he was, flesh and bone. Luke chapter 24. Page 4, bottom of the page, John Gill says, we will be a reflection of His shining glory. Just like the moon reflects the light of the sun, we will reflect the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Seal of Texas, he said, we will be able to do what Jesus did after His resurrection. The same things He was able to do. Move from place to place at the speed of thought. Appear in rooms with the doors locked. Eat and enjoy the fellowship of other saints. There will be no more sin where we go to be in heaven. Why heaven will be not boring? <laughs> God is not boring. He's the Almighty Creator. In His presence is the fullness of joy, Psalm 16. Never forget all the hugely talented people who have ever lived. Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, and John Martin. <laughs> All of these wonderfully talented people got their talent from God. He is extraordinarily talented. Heaven's not going to be boring for you and me. It's going to be magnificent. <laughs> it's going to be fabulous. That's what they say in New York. <laughs> Number two, we will be ruling and reigning with Christ forever. We will judge angels, Revelation 5 and 1 Corinthians 6. Number three, heaven is our home, Philippians 3. We will be reunited with our loved ones. What a glorious reunion that will be when all God's children are called home. God made man to be with him. C.S. Lewis said, God's creatures are not, are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exist. Let me say, uh, animals and people. We were born with desires. But those desires were not put in us unless the satisfaction of that desire exists. There is a desire in your life that God has provided a way to satisfy that desire. If I find in myself a desire which no experience on earth can satisfy, the most probable explanation is I was made for another world. I was made and you were made for another world. When we get to heaven, that gnawing ache in our souls, that itch you cannot scratch, which has never been satisfied here on earth, will be fully satisfied there. Rewards and five crowns. Paul said the saints will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. In the Greek, this is what we have heard several times, bima. The bima seat, 2 Corinthians 5.10. May I say that the word bima judgment seat is used about ten times in scripture and it refers to three different kinds of seats three different kinds of platforms number one there is a platform where a champion receives his rewards that's similar to an Olympic gold medalist he stands on a platform he gets his reward that's a bema seat that platform where he gets his reward is a bema seat there is also a high step or an elevated platform in so to speak raised up where both the person who gives the reward and the person who receives the reward stands before a huge crowd and they can cheer and applaud as the one who bestows the reward can say, applaud him, job well done. Applaud her, job well done. I think that's what it's going to be like in heaven. Jesus is going to be there and we will stand beside him as he rewards us. And all heaven is going to say, Thank God for His grace and mercy who provided all of this for all of us. Number three, it's a throne or a seat where a judge sits. Now, this is a guy 
who stands as a judge and you come up before him and then he's going to decide and determine your fate and your future. That is also a judgment seat, a bema seat. But pay attention to this. None of those descriptions are the great white throne judgment where there is condemnation and damnation that is measured out to those who have not trusted in God, whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. That place is a place of condemnation. That is not a place of judgment of blessing. It's a place of judgment of cursing. That's what the great white throne judgment is about. The rewards we receive are in addition to eternal life, a mansion and a perfect body. But the rewards of those at the great white throne are to be cast into a lake of fire. Now let me say something here before I go again. I'm going to take a small tangent. I have heard and preachers that I have listened to and I love them to pieces have said everything that you've done will be exposed. Every thought, every word, every deed will be broadcast for all of heaven and eternity to know about when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ in heaven. No, you won't. Why? Easy. You're washed in the blood. Every sin, every thought, every word, every act, every displeasure, every doubt is under the blood of Jesus Christ. Never. See, there, there, there's a nice little sermon I have one day. I'll share it with you. Things that God cannot do. One of them is He can't remember your sin that's under the blood. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Five crowns, the victor's crown, 1 Corinthians 9.25, imperishable, a reward. Number two, the crown of rejoicing, 1 Thessalonians 2. This is our crown to worship those who are involved in worship services, those who perform, who direct and guide worship services. This is your crown of rejoicing. This is what you're going to receive. The crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy 4. Paul tells us that this crown is for all those who love His appearing, do you sit there on your chair and tell me that you absolutely are just enraptured with the love and the possibility and the probability that the Lord could come in any minute? Does that just thrill your soul? Okay, crown of righteousness is yours. That's all it takes. The crown of life, James 1, 12, Revelation 2. For those who trust Him and believe Him, a crown of life. The crown of glory, 1 Peter 5, 4, the crown which appears... For those who are under shepherds, those who are pastors, worship leaders, elders, deacons, Sunday school teachers, cell group leaders, those who have gotten involved in church worship, there is a crown of glory that God is going to give to you. One more amazing reward that isn't mentioned, but I mention it every chance I get. The Lord himself is your chief reward. God said to Abraham, I will be your shield and your exceeding great reward. I hear these guys talk about wells you didn't dig, vineyards you didn't plant, and houses you didn't build. I don't want all that headache. That's a lot of maintenance nuisance. I don't want to mess with it. That's why I would prefer living in a townhouse and just hand some guy, you know, pay, would you please mow my yard and trim my bushes for me? Here, have some money. Go away. I don't want to mess with that stuff. Yeah, you know? And that's what you're going to get with all that other stuff. You know what I want? I want God. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Revelation 4.10 We find 24 elders leading all of heaven in worship, praise, thanksgiving to our God. He is worthy to receive all glory and power. He created all things and for His pleasure they are and were created. Many rewards that we will receive. Isaiah and Revelation tells us we'll get a new name. We'll have access to the tree of life, Revelation 2. We're going to give a white stone which is signifying of special favor and prosperity. Revelation 2, the morning star, the name of Jesus will be ours Himself. Revelation 2, 28, white garments, Revelation 3, 5, permanent access to God's sanctuary, Revelation 3, 12, and we will get to share the throne of Christ, Revelation 3, 21. All of those rewards are for you, for trusting in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior, for looking forward to His soon return, for believing His Word instead of believing Fox News. 
<laughs> I saw a comedian this last week. He says, he, he, you could fool any of your, your parents from if you live in Mississippi or Alabama. If you just come up with initials for something, they will believe you have a disease that needs to be taken care of and you can skip school. And one little boy said, Mama, I'm sick. I, I can't go to school. What do you have? I have MSNBC. <laughs> she says, Oh, no. You better get back in bed. I'll get you some soup. <laughs> and the boy went to bed saying, Hallelujah. <clears throat> a new heaven and a new earth. Abraham obeyed when God uh, called him to go to some place he'd never seen before. But he was looking for a place whose builder and maker was God, Hebrews 11.8. Friends, that's the new Jerusalem. The Jews are looking for a kingdom. They're looking for a city on earth that God has made. What are you looking for? From the time I was a squirt, way back when, I was really thin. I was thinner than Joey when I was small because I was sick. <coughs> I was real skinny. The teacher taught us, I got a mansion just over the hilltop. I can't remember anything else when I was growing up as a kid, but I remember that. I wasn't looking forward to anything down here. I was looking for something up there. I wasn't looking for the undertaker. I was looking for the upper taker. <laughs> huh? <laughs> There's 24 elders in heaven that are leading worship. How did they get to be sitting on crown or on thrones with crowns? It's their reward was given to them. When we get there, the full rewards are going to be given to us and we will have positions of authority, leadership, and power in the heavens. David Jeremiah described heaven or the new Jerusalem saying that it is not synonymous with heaven. The new Jerusalem streets of gold, pearl gates, foundation stones of precious jewels is the new Jerusalem. It's not heaven. The new Jerusalem is being built in heaven and it comes down out of heaven to the new earth all those songs about eastern gate are about the new jerusalem not about heaven i like those songs but it's not scriptural sorry during eternity future the new jerusalem will rest on the new earth god promised the jews a kingdom of earth but jesus promised christians eternal life in heaven. The dimensions of the New Jerusalem are extraordinary. 1,400 miles long, wide, and 1,400 miles tall. You're looking at over 2 million square miles. Compare the New Jerusalem to the United States. You start with the eastern seaboard from Florida to Maine. That's one side. You go from Florida to Colorado. That's the other side. You go from the southern border to the northern border to Canada. That's the other side. And then back to Maine. That's how big it is just on the footprint. Guess what? It's that much tall. It's that much tall. Denver's called the Mile High City. That's nothing. We're going 1,400 miles up. <clears throat> That's the New Jerusalem. The current physical dimensions of the earth cannot support the new Jerusalem as it's described. That's why God is making a new earth that will support the physical structures of that new Jerusalem. There's not one word about heaven. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, No eye has seen, no ear has heard. It has not entered into the heart of man what God has in store for them that love him. When we look at Revelation 21, we find God describing a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem comes down to the new earth from the new heaven. We are given information about the new earth and new Jerusalem, but not one word about the new heaven, just that there is one. Heavenly worship in Revelation 4, we find John being called up to heaven. When he gets there, he finds all of heaven in the process of worshiping God. John was part of the inner circle with Jesus. He was there at the Mount Transfiguration. He was there at Gethsemane. John stood next to Mary at the cross. He and Peter were the first ones to go to the empty tomb. And John outlived all the other disciples in his gospel. That is the most divine portrait of Jesus Christ as God and Creator. It's John that gives us the most information about things that go on in heaven. John tells us that there were 24 elders, that the saints that have been saved and glorified and placed on thrones around the throne of God. Many teachers tell us it's 12 out of each one of the 
the Testaments, 12 Old Testament, 12 New Testament, 24. John tells us about heaven from the inside. This is something that Jesus said he couldn't do with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. John, seeing all the grandeur of heaven, unwittingly became an eyewitness of what worship is like in heaven. <clears throat> A couple more minutes, I'm going to be done. This is the most powerful thing I'm going to be telling you all year. The end of this lesson. It's interesting to note that worship in heaven begins with a small or just a few groups and then it crescendos till it includes all of heaven. <clears throat> all the angelic hosts, all the saints worshiping God together. It begins with just a couple of people. Revelation 4 ends with a doxology that says all blessings and honor and glory and power and might and wisdom and thanksgiving be to our God forever and ever. Friends, there has never been a time in the history of the church that worship has been more prevalent on every level, by every saint, by every generation than it is right here, right now. Never, never, never has worship been so much an integral part of our daily life to praise the Lord Jesus Christ as it is right now. Christian radio stations can't play enough praise and worship music. Churches are incorporating more and more praise and worship into every gathering. New songs are filling our services. Christian music, CDs and DVDs, concerts outpace previous records. More and more secular artists are recording albums of worship and praise to the living God. If what I am suggesting is accurate... Believe me, the current crescendo of praise and worship that we are now experiencing on this earth is in perfect accord with what John experienced in heaven. The grand finale is upon us. The moment has come when we will all be gathered together in glorious praise and worship to the living God around His very throne in heaven. We are there at the crescendo of all of our praise and honor and glory to God. We're on the precipice. We're on the cusp of leaving this world and being in His presence. Be faithful. Trust Him. Believe Him. Follow Him. Adore Him. Don't let the world get you down. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May He cause His face to shine upon you. May He lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. May you know from a moment to moment that God is with you. God is carrying you. God is protecting you. God loves you. And He wants you to be in heaven more than you want to be there. In Jesus' holy name, be blessed. Amen and amen. Mucho thank yous. See you all next week.